I feel the peace inside of me. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues. I concluded last session discussing this book, The Eighth Scroll, uh, a book that I have authored. It can be found on Amazon.com. It can be found on the website, www.eighthscroll.com. And I would like to continue with this episode by doing something which I think is a little bit unusual, but it takes me back to my childhood. You have to remember, I'm 50 years old. When I was raised, we still had radio shows where they read dramas, and they played out a drama to the audience in a reading. And that is what I would like to do to you, or do for you, <laughs> inflict upon you, some might say, in this episode. I'll begin by reading the back cover of the book to give the audience a flavor. Those who saw the episode before, I described how the Eighth Scroll is an action-adventure novel. It is a novel that throws the audience into two very dynamic controversies. One is the controversy of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The other is the controversy of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The back cover reads as follows. An ancient scroll has been unearthed. 1,900 years after the Essene Jews hid their most precious scrolls in the caves at Qumran, a Catholic priest working on the Dead Sea Scrolls project discovers a text that describes the final edict of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but hides it in fear of the heresy it contains. When prominent archaeologist Frank Tones unearths a reference to the hidden scroll, he wonders if this scroll could be the long-lost gospel of Jesus or maybe even of James. But before he can act, those who know of the scroll's existence become mysteriously silent or dead, leaving only a father and son team to find the scroll and tell its secrets to the world. In an epic, multi-generational story that spans the globe, they must outwit the Mossad, the CIA, and the Vatican's secret weapon, the Mafia, the Italian Mafia, to bring the truth to light, no matter the cost. Let me begin. Let me give you a reading. I would like everybody in the audience, as I did when I was a child, to sit back and relax, maybe even close your eyes, listen to the story, and get a taste so that you understand where the story will take you and whether or not you would like to continue it on your own. Prologue. Qumran, on the Dead Sea. 68 CE. Qumran, I must say, is the area where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. 68 CE was the time when the keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, presumably the Essene Jews, were wiped out. That is the time when the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden. And this is how the story begins. When death approaches, your life will play before your eyes. The elder who told Jacob this years before now lay crumpled in a bloody heap before him, nestled in ringlets of his own intestines and oozing the stink of disembowelment. Jacob tore his gaze from the twitching corpse, locked eyes with the Roman legionnaire who lifted his weapon from the lifeless body, and froze when the legionnaire raised his gore-streaked sword for the stroke that would sever Jacob's neck. As though with a mind already detached, as though time in itself paused to honor him with one last memory, Jacob recalled not his whole life, but only the last hour. He had been hunched over in the bowl of his cave, working frantically to hide the Essenes' library of scrolls. One glance 
out the mouth of the cave at the darkening sky, mirrored in the vast expanse of the Dead Sea below, told him he had run out of time. Why did I ever join the sect of Essene Jews? If they knew my Christian beliefs, they would banish me forever. The instant he conceived the thought, his mind conjured up memories. Memories of slashing swords, screams, and bodies tumbling into the dust in pieces. That's why I joined, he said to himself, for protection. For a moment he reflected how, 30 years ago, the Romans had hunted down the disciples of Jesus, the Christ. Now, two years into the Jewish rebellion, the Romans hunted down all Jews, excepting his own sect of Essene Jews. But every Essene knew their scant protection could end at any instant, and Jacob couldn't banish from his fears the tales of wild beasts tearing Christians to pieces in the Roman Colosseum, which Emperor Nero had kept lit at night with human candles. Martyrs, he muttered, but found little consolation in the fact. Jacob snatched up the most precious of all the scrolls. The parchment whispered against his fingers as he swiftly rolled it. Despite his reverence for the scripture, his hands shook, and he splattered hot wax as he dripped it from his candle to seal the free edge of the scroll. He forced himself to draw deep breaths of the musty cave air until his hands steadied and then stamped the puddles of fast cooling wax with the Roman captain's signet ring. Then he applied a linen wrap and sealed the free edge of the wrap as well. He shoved the scroll into an exquisite limestone jar, but then froze. Gently, he placed the jar on the floor of the cave, grabbed handfuls of his shoulder-length hair close to his scalp with both hands and rocked himself until he felt his nerves still. Calm down, he told himself, just calm down. Slower now, Jacob removed the scroll from the jar, checked it for damage, and gently slid it back into the jar. Then he fitted the lid with a sandy rasp, picked up his sputtering candle, and poured a ribbon of molten wax into the seam. After he sealed the jar closed, but before the wax had a chance to cool, his Essene brothers arrived. Jacob jumped up and wrestled three earthenware jars, each half the height of a man and filled with scrolls to the cave entrance. He stumbled in his haste and nearly dropped one jar. The rough pottery slipped in his fingers, but he caught it in time. It bumped the floor of the cave, but didn't break. The brothers heaved the jars into their arms, cast Jacob a worried glance, and then hurried off to hide the jars in distant caves. Jacob returned to the cubit-long limestone jar sized for a single scroll and applied the captain's ring to the cooling wax around the lid. Why had the captain ordered him to hide the scrolls? Jacob had heard the rumors, of course. Roman legionnaires with Jewish sensitivities, or Christian Jewish in everything but name, Romans who tormented the followers of Jesus the Christ by day, and then prayed for forgiveness to the God Jesus had spoken of at night. He had heard such men existed, but had never met one, until the captain of the legionnaires. Jacob buried the limestone jar in the mountain of parchment sheets stacked in the center of the cavern. He said a quick prayer, sweat streaming from beneath his arms as he raised his quivering hands to the heavens and then bolted from the cave. The barren Judean desert seemed drawn closer to the heavens by the crimson ceiling of sunset, but Jacob had no time to enjoy the view. With practiced speed, 
He picked his way across the ridge of land that led to the complex, passing groups of legionnaires as they lounged on the terrace, their weapons ever near at hand. He feigned calm when he visited the captain in his quarters, but once he had returned the captain's signet ring, he rushed toward the dining hall's welcoming glow and the voices of his milling brethren, his fears flailing about in his mind. By the doorway and to the right, the captain had instructed. Why? Jacob wondered. Even as he entered the dining hall and sat as bidden, that why haunted him during the conversation and dinner that followed. Midway through the meal, and fighting the quivering weakness in his legs, he made to stand when the doorway filled with the bulk of, of a Roman legionnaire, his sword naked in his hand. Like shadows in an unfocused nightmare, Jacob could barely make out the mass of forms behind the soldier. He cast a glance at the only other exit. It, too, was filled with a clot of legionnaires. He scanned the room to find his brothers frozen, their food and drink suspended midway to their mouths. The Roman captain shouldered his way into the chamber and shouted, Stay sitting! The words caught a few brothers as they rose, and they lowered back to their seats while the captain repeated his command, this time more gently, as if to reassure a child. A child about to be slaughtered. Jacob realized. The captain let his eyes rest on Jacob a split second longer than on the others. Then he said, I have been ordered to kill anyone who refuses to swear loyalty to the Roman Empire. So that's it, Jacob thought. That's why the captain wanted the scrolls hidden. Until now, the captain continued. Your protector, Agrippa II, has never demanded an oath of allegiance. That has changed. With the rebellion of your people, an oath is demanded. And now, it's time for a break. So, we'll be back in just a few minutes. I feel the peace. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown, continuing with this episode of Interfaith Issues. In this episode, I am reading from my novel, The Eighth Scroll, and I will continue from where I left off. The Roman legionnaire captain is stating as follows. Until now, your protector, Agrippa II, has never demanded an oath of allegiance. That has changed. With the rebellion of your people, an oath is demanded. Our hands are empty, and you know it one of the Essenes said. We have no weapons. How are we a threat to you? My orders are absolute, the captain replied. You swear allegiance or die. Who is first? One of the brethren stood and strode toward the captain, a short, squat man of timid demeanor. Jacob knew this man only but slightly. The lead soldier stepped between the two and met the Essene's chest with the tip of his sword. Unshaken, the Essene said, We swear devotion to one, and to one alone, and then looked past the soldier and locked eyes with the captain. And the one to whom we swear devotion is the one who made us, and the one who made you, and the one to whom we shall all return. Another step closer, and the Essene forced the soldier to retract his arm into a fully cocked position, resting its tip against the brother's chest. The same one who will judge all of us, he said, and assign righteous to paradise and the sinful to hellfire. To this one, to the Almighty, we swear allegiance and to him alone. For a moment, Jacob felt the brother's words fill the chamber and bolster the faith of the believers. 
But then the soldier drove the sword home. The blade exploded a foot out the man's back. The soldier gave the sword a savage quarter turn, then wrenched it back with a sucking sound and a gush of blood. The squat man bent forward by the blow abruptly straightened and turned around to face his brothers. Triumph on his face, he pointed to the heavens with a smile. The second thrust drove the sword in the man's back and out the front. He staggered forward and looked down and blinked as he watched the blade retract through his chest. Then he dropped to his knees, coughed up a great gout of blood, fell sideways into the lap of a brother and died, a smile full on his bloodied lips. The captain stepped to the side and Jacob watched as soldiers surged from the darkened doorway like emissaries from hell. The air filled with shouts of testimony from the faithful, grunts and curses from the soldiers, and the wet chunking sound of meat met by metal. Swords swept in great arcs, blades plunged into bodies, and battle axes cleaved the air and buried their blades in flesh and bone. An occasional groan escaped the dying, but never a scream or a sob, and not one oath of allegiance to the Romans. Jacob found himself on his hands and knees, sheltered between the wall and the legs of the captain. The soldiers were crazed, the chamber poorly lit, and the legionnaires flowed through the doorway, straight past him, with nary a glance backward. Jacob's favored elder fell to his knees nearly in front of him, groaning incoherently as he scrabbled to scoop up the guts that spilled from his slit open belly. The Roman who stood over the elder beheaded him with a swipe of his sword, kicked the corpse to the floor, and then knelt beside it and hacked at the headless torso. Horrified, Jacob nestled closer to the wall. The legionnaire pulled his sword from the elder's body, turned, and latched eyes with Jacob. Standing, he lifted his blood-streaked sword and stepped into striking range. When death approaches, your life will play before your eyes. Jacob's mind snapped back when the captain whirled, jerked Jacob to his feet, and pinned him against the cold stone wall, waving the soldier away. To Jacob, the captain whispered harshly. Jacob jerked his eyes back to the captain's face, a grim, taut mask, with eyes that betrayed only the barest twinkle. He gasped a breath in two quick stutters and yelled, I swear allegiance. I swear allegiance. Soldiers turned from their kills and snickered, unaware of the props behind the play. The closest legionnaire lowered his sword, spat into the dirt floor and turned away in disgust. This one bears true allegiance, the captain yelled to them. Let no one harm him, for he is under my protection. He turned back to Jacob and whispered, Peace be with you, my friend. Pray for me. Then he swung Jacob around like a puppet and shoved him through the doorway, straight into the arms of a waiting legionnaire. And at that moment, Jacob knew death. The certainty of it cast a blanket of calm over him, and he closed his eyes in prayer. Hey, enough of that, the legionnaire said with a grim chuckle. Look where that got your friends. Jacob froze, disbelieving. But the legionnaire grabbed his arm and led him out of the complex. At first, his legs faltered, but the legionnaire steadied him, as though guiding a man feeble with fever. At the outer wall, the Roman belted something about his waist and whispered, food and currency. Jacob's fear-weakened legs nearly buckled when the legionnaire draped 
a full water skin over his shoulders, but he straightened immediately when he felt a ring slipped onto his finger. Captain changed his mind, the soldier said. He said, you'll be needing this more than he. Now listen carefully. If anyone stops you, show him the ring. That will guarantee you safe passage. Next, use your water sparingly. It must last you until you find safety. You can't go to Jerusalem. That would be suicide. So take the trade route opposite. And stay away from here until this is over. And Jacob, and Jacob, may God be with you. Jacob swallowed hard with a throat sucked dry by fear. So it was true. There were friends, albeit the most hypocritical kind, in the ranks of the Romans. But there was no time for talk, and the legionnaire gave him a push start backward into the darkness and drew his sword. Jacob stood numbly and watched, helpless as a lamb before the slaughter, but the soldier only winked and disappeared back into the complex. For a moment, Jacob stood rooted to the spot, but then the demons of his fears spun him around and chased him into the night. This is only the beginning of the Eighth Scroll. From here, the book transports the audience into modern day. As I said before, this book will take the audience from their lounge chairs in America to a lounge chair in England where the story continues. From there on to the Holy Land. It will transport the reader around the world and through time. It will transport the reader into the heart of the controversies over the Dead Sea Scrolls, over the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and over the differences between the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions. But more than anything else, it will take the reader's imagination on a ride, on an adventure, through all of this, and inshallah, give them a story they will never forget. So, I conclude this, this episode of Interfaith Issues by thanking you. Once again, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown, your host of this episode, and asking all those who wish to read further, please go to my website, eighthscroll.com, E-I-G-H-T-H, scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L, dot com, or my second website, leveltruth.com, L-E-V-E-L, T-R-U-T-H dot com. For now, and until the next episode, peace. Where are we going in this world of woe? So much suffering and misery. Our hearts are longing for the endless home of peace and love and harmony.